We're blessed to be a blessing. A life to make a difference. There's hope for my brother, hope for my sister. Life more abundantly. Hello family, this is E. Dewey Smith. I want to welcome you to another segment of the Living Hope Broadcast, an outreach ministry of the House of Hope Atlanta. I'm so excited that you've tuned into our service on today. I pray that this broadcast is a blessing to you and your entire family and community. And by the way, if you're ever in the Metro Atlanta community, please feel free to stop and worship with us at the House of Hope. We're located about 15 minutes from downtown Atlanta on the east side, and our worship celebrations are held every Sunday morning at 7.30 and 10.15. And of course, each Wednesday at 12 noon, we have a lunchtime with the Lord Bible study, then a 7 p.m. evening Bible study. Come by and worship with us, fellowship with us. I love to personally meet and greet you. Why don't you call a friend, call a relative, call a neighbor, and let them know the Living Hope is on the airwaves. We're presenting a practical word to a perilous world. I want you to know that's some good news today. Get your Bibles and be blessed by this wonderful, wonderful teaching that's transformative. God bless you. Two scriptures. You have Genesis 11, 6. Say, I got it. It's Pentecost Sunday, and I want to juxtapose two realities. Genesis 11 and the 6th verse. It says, And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they all have one language. And this they began to do, and nothing, now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us, this is God saying, let us go down and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad throughout the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth. And from thence the Lord scattered them upon the face of the earth. You see that? Verse 8, verse 9, therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language. Somebody say confound the language. Acts chapter 2, just for a moment. Acts chapter 2, I want you to come with me to Acts 2. And when you get found Acts chapter 2, I want you to say, I got it, Acts chapter 2. And I want you to keep your hands on both those scriptures, Acts chapter 2. And Acts chapter 2, it says in verse 1, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. It filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues of fire. And it sat upon them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noise abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded. Check this out. Because that every man heard them speak his own language. I want to talk from this thought this morning, another chance to get it right. Another chance to get it right. I want you to say this word with me, diluvian. Diluvian. D-I-L-U-V-I-N. Diluvian. Diluvian. That's an important word because it's a dispensational word in terms of Scripture. You have what's called that. Some call the antediluvian period. Some call the post-diluvian period. Maybe an unfamiliar word, but it just simply means flood. Say diluvian, diluvian. When we talk about dispensations in Scripture, you have two realities. You have a pre-diluvian and post-diluvian dispensation. 
You have a world that existed biblically before the flood and one that existed after the flood. Say diluvia, diluvia. After the flood, I want to assume that everybody knows when I was a boy preacher, the old preacher would say, you know the story. They would preach sometimes, you hear them say, y'all know the story. Well, the reality is most folk don't know the story. And I don't want to assume everybody knows the story, but because of the fall of humanity, God decided in Genesis chapter 6 that God would have to recreate the world. Genesis 6, 6, it says, God said, it repented me that I ever made humankind. So God raised up a family of a guy named Noah. Can somebody say Noah? Noah's family found grace in the sight of God, and God said, Noah, I want you to preach for 120 years. And when you preach for 120 years, what I'm going to do, I'm going to do something that's never been done before. I'm going to send rain. And up to that point, they had never seen rain. God gives Noah the dimensions of the ark and tells Noah, I want you to take the animal and take your family because I'm going to let it rain. It's going to rain for 40 days and 40 nights, but it's going to flood for over a year. Noah, what I'm going to do, I'm going to repopulate or restart the whole earth. I'm going to wipe it clean of the evil and start over. God sends the floodwaters when Noah is 600 years old. And the Bible says in Genesis chapter 9, verse 9, Verse 19, rather, that Noah had three sons. Can the church say three sons? The three sons of Noah, according to Genesis 9, 19, the first one whose name was Shem. Say Shem. The second one's name was Japheth. And the third one's name was Ham. He had three sons, Shem, Japheth, Ham. These were the three sons of Noah. And the Bible says, and of them was the whole earth overspread. Are y'all with me here? And so we're talking post-diluvian. After the flood, Noah's three sons were tasked with the responsibility of repopulating the whole earth. And so after the flood that destroyed the earth, every race biblically can be traced back to the three sons of Noah. The first son's name was Shem. Another derivative of that is Sim. It's believed that the Semites or the Jewish people were the descendants of Shem. You hear the word Semitic. That means Jewish. You've also heard the word anti-Semitic. That means to be against Jews. Shem is the post-flood, post-diluvian father of Jewish people, Hebrew people with the son of Noah, Shem. He had another son called Japheth. Can the word church say Japheth? It's believed that the European race descended from Japheth. Japheth is the father of the European nation. Then he has another son whose name is Ham. And you can tell by that name, black folks came from Black folk came from Ham. Well, Ham has children. Uh, There's a lot to the story I can't really get into, but Ham has children. Ham ends up having four sons of his own. Are y'all with me here? I want you to go to Genesis. I want you to look at the sons of Ham. In, 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 In Genesis chapter 10, I want you to see whose Ham's sons were. I'm, I'm establishing something going somewhere because I want you to really understand this. And this is very, very important because what you will discover is these sons were all very, very important. Verse, chapter 10, verse 1 through 4 through 6, uh, does the writer give us the descendants of each particular demographic? As a matter of fact, if you come to The sixth verse, I want you to take a look at the sons of Ham. Ham is the ancestral father of four sons. One's name is Cush. You thought that was just something you smoked. (laughs) 
No, that was a, that was a real name, Cush. Cush, Mizraim, Phut, and Canaan. Now, I want to talk about that first son, Cush. Cush is what we get the word Cushite from. Cush means a person with a sunburned face. The Cushites, according to John Jackson, were the founders of the Mesopotamian civilization. Their history started uh, perhaps around the 4th, 4200 BC. They were Cushites. Another term for Cush is the word Ethiopian. Ethiopian and Cushite means the same thing. And so Ham's sons were all African sons. Cush gives birth to the Cushites, the Ethiopians. Mizraim is the ancestor father of a group we call the Egyptians. Say Egyptians. Uh, Phut and Canaan is the ancestor father of the Canaanites. And so what we discover here, brothers and sisters, is that these four sons of Ham helped to populate Africa and the great military kingdoms of this world. Are you with me here? And so you have Noah, father, Ham, son, Cush, grandson. But I'm going to take a look here at Noah's great-grandson. Very, very important. It's in verse number 8 because he's been given a bad rap historically. But Cush has a son. And Cush's son, Ham's grandson, Noah's great-grandson, is called Nimrod. Are y'all going to stay with me for a minute? Nimrod is the first ruler, the first worldwide ruler in the world. He's a mighty man upon the earth. He had his own kingdom. Are you listening to me here? He's a mighty man, a mighty warrior. Verse 9 says he's a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. Look at verse 10. And the beginning of his kingdom. So Nimrod had his own kingdom. The kingdom of Babel and Erik and Akkad and Kalna in the land of Shinar. Y'all see that Shinar? You see it? Out of that land came both Assur and Nineveh and Rehoboth and, and, Rehoboth and Kala. These were all the kingdoms of Nimrod. Now, I need to deal with that for a moment because if we're not careful, we can let uh, Prince Harry and Prince William and Prince Charles make us think that they're the only royalty. I want you to understand, before Louis XIV, before Henry VIII, uh, before the monarchs of, 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 of England, you got to go to the University of Timbuktu in the city of Sankore. You got to go to the Queen of Sheba, Nefertiti, Akhenaten, King Tut. Y'all got the brakes on me around here. Before, before Europeans discovered the strength and the mysteries and the genius of Africa. We had built the Sphinx and the pyramids. We had discovered mathematics and science and chemistry and geometry. Y'all got the brakes on me here. We've got to refocus and reposition our young people to understand that you're not the minority, that you don't go to the back of the classroom because your people came from Africa as dumb and stupid and pellegra. No, no, we discovered the Pythagorean theory. We, we were Science. We were fitted. You cannot look at civilization and geography and astrology and astronomy without looking at the genius that comes from Africa.
Can I, can I anchor ship just for a second? You can't be good enough to get to heaven off of something you did. You can't know enough scriptures. You can't be holy. You can't be righteous enough to get to heaven based on your own work. Can I tell you how you get to heaven? How I get to heaven? For by grace are you saved. Not of yourselves, not of works, lest any man should boast. Let me help you right here. We can stop trying to impress each other when we realize that whatever we built, it wasn't tall enough to get to heaven because we ain't smart enough. We ain't good enough. When you and I get to the point to realize we can't build a resume, we can't build credentials that's so wonderful that can get to heaven of ourselves. So while we're trying to impress each other, if none of us are good enough anyhow, we can't get anywhere. Any height we get in life is going to be sustained it's going to only be because God gave you grace I, I wish you shake the neighbors and say neighbor where I am he brought me what I know he taught me what I have he gave me where I am he made me somebody shot right now everything I am right now is not because of me but it's because he gave me grace so I don't care how high you get when you get there you'll still be looking up to our great God Somebody shout, humble yourself, humble yourself, humble yourself. You ain't good enough. You ain't smart enough. You're not more anointed. You can't judge nobody. You can't, you don't have a heaven or hell to put nobody in. You can't get to heaven by yourself. When it, whenever you get up in the morning, say, God did it. When you get a car, they say, that's a nice car. Say, God did it. Uh, how you got that job? God gave it to me. Oh, you graduate? Yes, God helped me make it. Uh, how you been suspended? It ain't me. Everything I have is because God did it for me. I'm going somewhere. Great people trying to build a city, but they, try, they think they can get to heaven without grace. They think they can see God without the blood. What can wash away my sins? What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Why I do it? Because it reaches to the highest mountain, why I do it? It flows to the Lord's valley, why I do it? His blood will give me strength from, I wish I had somebody who understood. I ain't saved enough, I ain't holy enough, I ain't righteous enough. I'm only here right now, cause the blood of Jesus. They think they can get to heaven, cause they're smart. Just because you got some accomplishments don't mean you can save yourself. I, I, I want to say a word. I know the world is watching. 180 countries are watching, but I want to make this specific hermeneutic to African Americans. Listen, that's why E. Franklin Frazier in his book on the e, on, called The Black Bourgeoisie, E. Franklin Frazier suggests the problem with African Americans now is that the more affluence we receive, the more accomplished we become, the less fervent we get in devotion to God. Uh, media, team, media team sent me some footage last week, blessing my life, showing me some old footage. And I remember in the 80s when saints would shout. And I remember seeing some of the faces of people 30 years ago on videotapes, shouting and praising God and falling out. On the power of God, saints went in. And I looked at their faces and I really stood. The saints that were going in had a story. The saints that were struggling didn't mind standing, screaming and hollering out. They say stuff like, thank you, Jesus. But now we got Test two suburban Negroes. <laughs> that left Bankhead and shopping Buckhead. Left Pittsburgh and now live in Ithonia and they just shifted the terminology from thank you Jesus. And they are now these one tier saints. Thank you Jesus. When the devil did we become thank you Jesus. It ain't thank you, that's T-I-T-H-I-N-K. When I think about how good God has been to me, what God brought me from, I ain't no thank you, Jesus.
his hammer. Thank you, Jesus. You brought me. Is there anybody around this house can shout? Look at your neighbor and say, I came to thank him, not think him. Hey. Thank you for what do you don't know the hell I've been through. You don't know the storms he's brought me out of. I didn't came to be a one tier figure. I came to let them all flow and say, thank you. You brought me. Shake your neighbors and say, you didn't bring yourself. I don't care how high you get, it's cause grace is gonna take you down. Stop trying to go higher on your own. And realize that you stay small enough for long enough, God will make you big enough soon enough. They smart. They got rich history. They got some education, uh, got a few accomplishments, but they think they got the power to get to heaven without grace. And, and, and here's the problem. Verse 4, they said, we, we, we don't need God to go to heaven. We can do it ourselves. And then here's how you know some of us are from this tribe. They said, and, uh, let us make us a name nothing, nothing wrong with the brick nothing wrong with the kingdom nothing wrong with the mortar the slime nothing wrong with the city nothing wrong with the tower but when you think you can get to heaven without blood being shed And not only is your method wrong, but now your motive is wrong. Because the motive is not, let's build us a tower to reach heaven so we can see God. The motive is, let's do this so us can have us. A big name. Why do you do what you do? Are you serving only because you want your name called? Do you serve only because you want your little title? Want to be seen? Want to sit on the stage? As long as your name was Sue, you came to both Bible studies on Wednesday. You were the ERS, the VOP, and you sung the male chorus. <laughs> came to do something Saturday, came to Life University. So did everything to be a blessing, but now, you start preaching and we gave you a license. And now you want to be evangelist, Reverend Doctor, Right Potentate, Presbyteros, Episcopos, Didascalos, Diaconos, Sue of the House of Hope, Greater Travelers Rest, Baptist, AME, Full Gospel of Georgia, of the Southeastern District of the Western Hemisphere. Sit down, Sue. It ain't about your title, it's about your testimony. It ain't about where you sit, it's about where you serve. If I somebody as I pass along if I can cheer somebody with the word of song if I can show somebody they're traveling wrong then it's my living not in vain let me tell you what David said David said it ain't about your name let me tell you what David said David said he leads us Y'all make me work real hard. He leads us in paths of 
not righteousness. Far. Tell your name. It ain't, it ain't about your name. It ain't about your name. Do me a favor. When I count to three, I want you to call your name. One, two, three. That's total confusion. One more time. Call your name. One, two, three. That's chaotic and dissonant. One, two, three, say your name. That's incongruent and inharmonious. One, two, three. That's impotent and lifeless. But this time on three G, there's one, two, three. That's power. In that name, one, two, three. That's deliverance and breakthrough in that name. When we come in our name, there's no power. But when we come in his name. That's it. I'm finished. So God said, y'all stay with me, I'm, I'm, take, I'm taking this on a journey. So God, God, verse eight, God said, verse five, God said, you know what? I gotta give them credit, cause they figured out something. What they figured out is when they act like I act, which is in unity. God's creation of humankind took place when God was unified with God's self. Genesis 1, 26, God said, let us make man in our image. The unity of the triune Godhead was operative and unified in God making humankind. Now God says, whenever human beings come together, they are more like me than ever before. Y'all missed something. There's nothing that can be withheld from them when they're unified. Because their unity brings on the divine into what they're unified about. But y'all still not feeling me here. There's nothing a husband and wife can't accomplish when they're together. There's nothing a team can't do when they play together. There's nothing a church can't do when the church comes together. And God said, wait a minute, let me go, let me go check out what they're doing down there. Family, I hope you've been blessed by the message. You've got to stop there. I'm certainly out of time, but not out of message. You need to get this entire message right now for you and your family. The information is on the screen for how you can get it. I want you to get it. Maybe you know someone who can benefit from it. Come on, get it. Show it into their lives uh, so they can be empowered and encouraged just like you have been. And by the way, I want you to know if ever you're in Atlanta, come by and worship with us. We are a church that ministers to five generations. We have great outreach ministries for our community domestically and around the world. I gotta leave you now. The time is far spent. But as always remember this, if you will be good to God, then God will be good to you. You've been watching Living Hope. See you next time. We are